Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Matt McEwen. My name is Mark Burnett. Uh, we are uh, core members of the airship team, and today we'd like to talk to you a little bit about Deckhand. Uh, first, we're going to give you an overview of uh, airship and what Deckhand is and how they fit together. Uh, then we're going to uh, go through Deckhand's features uh, one by one so that you can see them, uh, sort of how the magic happens. Uh, and then uh, we're going to go through use cases, uh, both airship and non-airship use cases for Deckhand. Uh, and then we're going to have some Q&A. But please uh, feel free to uh, interrupt us. The lights are bright up here, um, but I'll try to watch for waving hands and, and pause. Uh, uh, feel free to, to interrupt us. So uh, before we get into Deckhand, let's talk a little bit about Airship as a whole to, so you can see how they fit together. Uh, Airship is a platform that uh, lets you uh, take a collection of YAML manifests that uh, define your site. So a, uh, many of them are uh, literally Kubernetes manifests. Uh, many of them are inspired by Kubernetes manifests because uh, Kubernetes did a really good job um, with their declarative YAML-based approach. And that's kind of what we extended uh, for the rest of site provisioning uh, with Airship. Uh, so we take, all, uh, we take a Git repository of these YAML manifests. We feed them through a front door API. Uh, one of our components for Airship is the uh, sort of the front door API that orchestrates uh, all of the activities involved in standing up a site. Uh, and then uh, all of the different actions like provisioning bare metal, like uh, standing up Kubernetes, a resilient Kubernetes cluster, like defining the networks and the network policies, uh, and then uh, deploying all of the software that goes into a full OpenStack uh, distribution, like um, OpenStack itself, as well as logging and monitoring, uh, et cetera. Uh, and it does all of this uh, by starting with containers as the primary unit of software delivery and Helm charts as the, uh, I, sh I should say, probably the only method of software deployment. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, put our, our, our uh, money on, we, we have bet on the, uh, the horse of uh, containers and Helm charts with uh, Airship. This is where we are opinionated. Uh, so, oh, was there a question? Okay, uh, so you can see um, one of the different uh, airship components in that little box up there. Uh, you have dry dock, shipyard, deckhand, diving bell, armada, and promenade that all work together. Um, they're all you know, different uh, projects that can be used individually or together. Um, and deckhand is the one that manage, uh, manages the YAML manifests inside of the cluster. So, uh, if everything in your site is defined by a YAML, clearly YAMLs are central uh, to what you are doing. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background on how, on how this platform has developed. So um, we've been working on it for uh, close to two years now. Um, and the first component that really had any, any code was Armada. And that's the component that you may have seen in other talks where uh, it's used to de coordinate the deployment of multiple Helm charts. So the initial work on OpenStack Helm, uh, we quickly realized we needed something a little more than what Helm offered for dependency management and multiple chart management. And so that's where Armada came from. Uh, and then very quickly after that, we started working on dry dock for bare metal provisioning, um, which is really just a declarative uh, front end for, for pluggable backends, where the main backend that we're using is Maz. Um, and then we started working on Promenade, which is the resilient Kubernetes deploy, uh, deployment tool. And so in uh, summer of last year, uh, we were doing a, a proof of concept where we pulled all these things together and, and made it go. Um, we realized while we were working on this POC that um, actually we were becoming overwhelmed by the amount of configuration that we had. Um, so YAML is, is great. It's structured. But we had a lot of it. Um, <clears throat> And in particular, there's quite a bit of duplication, right? So you need some of the same things in your chart that defines Neutron and Nova component configuration, as well as in the bare metal nodes, as well as um, in Promenade for networking and node names and so on. 
So we realized that we were getting surrounded by config, and so we needed to consolidate this. Um, we cared very much about keeping the components separate. We didn't want to just have airship config.yaml and it be one thing. We wanted you to be able to run drydock by itself without promenade, promenade without drydock, et cetera. Um, and so they needed really to be independent, which meant we were going to accept that there was going to be duplication in the format of, of configuration documents that these things consumed. So it, what we decided to do was build a new component that would address a few of the concerns around this. It would help us with deduplicating this information, um, which is critical with how much we were becoming overwhelmed. And uh, also, the, uh, the belief was, and I think this has worked out pretty well, that we could isolate uh, encryption of sensitive data. So certificate keys come through these YAMLs as well. And Deckhand manages securing those, and the components don't care about it. They receive them in clear text over TLS. Um, so yeah, so Deckhand is really central to the platform. These are the five components again. Um, and the config, while still large, is much more manageable uh, routed through Deckhand than I think it would have been otherwise. So again, deduplication was the number one thing that we were concerned about while sticking to the, to the idea of, of keeping it independent. Uh, secret management, I mentioned um, passphrases, certificate keys are the two prime examples. And we really wanted to keep a history of the configuration in the site. Um, we, from the beginning, were planning to deploy a very large number of sites. Um, and so it's one thing to have a Git repository of your YAML, of your configuration saying, this is what's going into the site. That's just your intent, right? And that's great, but um, how do you know what has actually been there? Um, so we really wanted to keep that history in one place, on the site, what's been here. Uh, and so that was a, that was, those were sort of the main features that we wanted. And we had a few opinions about it, or uh, uh, things to go about here. Um, so the configuration has to live on site. Um, it has to be immutable. And we didn't want to impose a lot of restrictions on what the configuration for the next component was going to be like. Um, and so given all these, um, we came up with a Kubernetes-inspired document format, which is um, sort of a push versus pull model. So rather than doing templating like a, a number of configuration systems do, um, we have structured data block at the bottom, which we'll get to in a minute. So you define a schema for your particular type of configuration document. And so uh, these are namespaced. You can see example foo v1 might be like uh, promenade kubelet v1, which would be Kubelet configuration owned by Promenade. Um, and so maybe I'll just click these. <laughs> oh. um, and then we have a metadata section, which is quite large in some cases. Um, and this, this supports the push model, where we don't, um, we don't pull via templating, which I'll show in some of the features later. Um, but documents all have a name, and the metadata has a schema, um, which is just a sort of a core part of it, which we'll get to later as well. Um, but the metadata section in general contains quite a few things. Labels, again, inspired by Kubernetes for selecting documents. Um, details about feature usage. So here we have uh, layering definition, substitutions, sort of deduplication features, which we will talk about in detail. So they're all defined in this metadata section. And, and Deckhand defines what this looks like. This metadata section is sort of owned by Deckhand and structured. But <clears throat> And then, so storage policy clear text, this would be how you indicate storage policy encrypted would mean, hey, you wanna, wanna treat this like a secret and store it in encrypted fashion. Um, but the data section is where we're unopinionated. This can be anything that's valid YAML, okay? And you can write a schema for it, a JSON schema style thing for validation, so. All right. So uh, the first uh, feature that uh, Deckhand uh, supports that is um, relevant for this uh, is uh, on solving those problems is substitution. And uh, substitution uh, is something that takes two different YAML documents uh, and takes data from one and puts it into the other. So up here on top, you have uh, some data uh, in the source document, and then on the bottom, uh, you have your destination document. And the way it works is, uh, you know, well, up here you, you see the, the intention, right? Uh, the data that's going to get, uh, get merged uh, is, or substituted rather, is that key one, value one. And then uh, in your destination document, you have a, a stanza in the metadata section that defines where you would like that substitution to come from and where you would like it to go. So the source 
uh, defines uh, not just the document, but also the data that you want to pull from. That's what you, uh, why you see that little link there. Um, and then uh, it uh, puts it into the destination uh, in the resulting document, the rendered document that you get when you uh, take the, uh, the, the piece parts and then uh, put them together. Uh, so on the right, you see the rendered document. Um, the, uh, one important thing is that uh, the two documents here uh, don't have to have the same schema. They don't have to be the same type of document. And in fact, that's the way it normally is. Uh, usually you have um, a, a document uh, that sort of lets you define in one place a particular piece of data and then many different schemas or many different types of documents that uh, you'd like to substitute that value into. So to make it a little more concrete, uh, the way that um, in our reference manifests that uh, we have in the Airship Treasure Map uh, project, uh, we, have a, um, we have a file that has all of our containers defined in one place, all of the, uh, the different uh, repositories for them uh, and the different hashes for the versions and those sorts of things, right? And then um, those, that one uh, file gets substituted into all of the different, um, all the different files that need to know about containers, which in Airship is all, many of them. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that, that's, that does two different things. First, uh, first and foremost, it is deduplication, right? So uh, many of those containers are used across many different Helm charts. And the ability to define them in one place uh, gives you the flexibility to, um, to specify them in one place and then have that get replicated out to many places. Uh, the second thing that that does is uh, just from an organizational standpoint, it lets you combine similar data together so that um, when you go and update uh, the versions of containers that you're integrating into your site, integrating into your uh, CI build, um, there's just one place you have to go to make all of those changes and it cuts down on the guesswork. Yeah, and this isn't only for version management. We use substitution anytime you have something that you are likely to intentionally change from site to site. So it's used for like the control plane host names and IP addresses and stuff, which go into a whole host of documents um, related to certificates and all sorts of stuff you can imagine. So that's, that's one of the main purposes for use. Versions are a fantastic example, a big one. Um, and it's the kind of thing, it's like, we want to intentionally vary this, so we're going to use substitution here. And so that's the and uh, you know, going with uh, the other example, um, uh, you know, endpoints, for example, right, where you have a lot of things that might go into one of these. You might have a host name and a port and a context, right? Uh, let's say that you had a um, you had one string, one endpoint string that was generally the same, but in different contexts, you might want to use a different host name. Uh, Deckhand also supports um, substitution of a substring of a field using regular expressions. Um, so you could swap out uh, just the host name um, part of a uh, field in your, uh, your YAML um, and then get a little bit more deduplication out of it, a little more simplicity. Um, and up here you, you see one example of a, of a substitution, right? You, you see a, a particular um, field that is getting substituted in. Um, if You can have as many of those as you want and they would just be additional items in the substitutions list in the destination document. And it, you're also not limited to just a single, um, a single uh, key value. You can substitute in um, you know, a tree. Which we also actually make quite a bit of use of uh, for OpenStack Helm charts, which use an endpoints format that's quite large but repeated. Mm -hmm. All right, the next uh, key feature of Deckhand is layering. Layering lets you uh, split out your, um, your YAML into things that are uh, common and things that are site specific. Uh, that, at least that's sort of the, the main use case for it. It can be used for other things as well. Uh, it is essentially a uh, YAML hierarchy or a, a YAML inheritance model. Um, and so, uh, like I mentioned, uh, if you have uh, YAML documents that are mostly the same across all of your sites, uh, then um, this lets you capture all of that sameness in the, the parent document and then 
uh, the child document can inherit that and specify in a very small child document uh, just the things that are site specific. So like the IP addresses and the host names, that kind of thing. So the way this works is uh, you, uh, the child will reference out to its parent using a label-based selector. Uh, and here you see us using a single label, um, arbitrary colon label, that, that just means it can be anything. Uh, it can also be more than one label that you join on. This is essentially a, a join kind of operation, right? Um, so you, you specify that. And then the, uh, you, you specify sort of how you want the layering to take place. And then um, if you, uh, in, in the normal case where you merge entire documents, uh, the uh, data from the parent and the data on the, uh, in, in the child are deep merged together. Um, which is to say it's, uh, you can see the, the entire tree structure of the parent is merged with the entire tree structure of the child. Um, and that is, uh, that is, um, actually you're gonna say something. Well, th that, is, that is the main thing that we do. There are a few cases um, where rather than doing a site specific override, which certainly we do sometimes, um, uh, will override and delete certain settings because it's a test environment that doesn't have. So you can see there, it's method merge. That's the normal one. It means merge the data from the two documents. But there's also delete and replace. Um, so those are the kinds of things you can do. Yep. Uh, and so merge is, merge is the normal case. But yeah, if you, if you didn't have a delete, then you, there would be no way for a child to say, I don't want any of this particular you know, branch of the YAML structure. You just throw it away. Um, and, uh, we have a question. Yay, thank you for asking a question. So the question was, were we inspired by tree-based uh, data handling tools that existed? Not directly. Um, the, um, yeah, only indirectly, I would say. I think the main conversation around how to do this was on some level about should we do a pull model where you have some template and you're just pulling the data in, or should we do something more structured like this um, where it's a pushing into it. And I think the main driver for going with this, which you'll see later, is that applications can specify data schemas as well here. So rather than some INI file that you're templating into, which is hard to validate, um, you can validate that the, the data fields are there as you expect. Um, I'm not aware of something that has all of that, uh, but I could just be lack of sight there. I would say the main inspiration for this was uh, the use case that we were solving for in that, uh, you know, at AT&T, right, we have um, done, we have done multi-site deployments, managed uh, many, many clouds for a long, long time, and have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. And so we really wanted to um, ensure when we were starting from scratch with Airship that uh, we were able to, um, to capture the, uh, the majority of configuration in one place and the site-specific information in another place in a very predictable way that if you set it up right is easy to continuously integrate and to test ahead of time and then uh, to, you know, to, to, to take all the guesswork out of it as much as possible. So um, that is what, that is sort of the problem. That is the uh, one of the big domains that Airship tries to solve for and why you'd want to use this stuff is uh, is if you are using many, many sites. If you're using one site, well, Airship is great for that too, um, but layering isn't going to get you as much. So to take advantage of layering, um, you have to define um, a layering policy, which is another YAML document in your Git repository of YAML documents, but it's what's called a control document. Um, and all that means is it's some extra configuration for uh, deckhand. It's not something that gets rendered out into um, the different components in Airship. It's, it's special information just for deckhand to tell it how to do its job. 
Um, and so in this layering policy, you see that uh, we have three different layers uh, defined, a global layer, a type layer, and a site layer. Um, this is driven by this document, so it's uh, completely configurable. And these three choices were what we chose for our initial reference uh, architecture for, uh, for layering in our, our real life use cases, as well as in our, our upstream reference uh, manifests. And so, and, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, and to be clear, these were chosen uh, not based on, on some fully flushed out uh, vision of what we thought the configs would look like. It was, well, we need to deploy a site. Um, how many layers do we want to use? And so we're like, let's use three. <laughs> this makes sense. So we sort of went with that for a long time, and, and we're looking very seriously at branching into many more layers, some more features around picking and choosing what bits you want. Uh, yes. How far down do you go? Do you say, oh, I've got four racks, and do you does each rack represent a layer, or do you just stop at seeing a site? So, great question. To be completely clear here, um, these layers are only used by deckhand to determine how to do that layering feature, so that inheritance feature for the config. If you want to talk about particular racks or what have you, um, that would just be part of your configuration. So the names here are not actually important. They're just conceptual. That the, the name is global or site. It's just a conceptual thing. Yeah, within within a site, um, you uh, other other airship capabilities um, make use of Kubernetes labeling uh, to uh, you know sort of treat different servers differently if they're different types of servers and deploy different services to them. Um, the all of the different. Uh, definitions for all the different uh, servers and racks, et cetera, um, would be part of the same uh, site definition. Um, so yeah, uh, global is what you think it is. It's, um, the, the intention here is that it is where you put most of your configuration that is uh, applicable across all your sites. A type uh, would be um, a it's kind of a flexible definition, but it can be um, sort of like a flavor of site, right? If you have, if you have sites for one particular use case, um, like 5G, and you have uh, sites for another use case, like uh, CICD um, environments that have Jenkins or Zool um, running in them, then those might be different types. And then at the site layer, you uh, define all your, uh, the small bit of site-specific stuff. And you can, uh, you can see from the table up here that this, uh, in practice, really does help um, this is uh, taken from uh, one of our uh, internal uh, definitions that we use for um, all of our uh, labs and our internal sites right now at AT&T. And uh, at the global level, um, we have 24,000 lines of YAML definition uh, at that level. And for um, our primary uh, use case site type, we have uh, 3,500. And then for a, a particular site, we have 1.8 thousand. So you can see that um, there is a order of magnitude difference between each of these different layers, um, which means that there is that much configuration that you don't have to work with your you know, deployment engineers and um, et, et cetera to, to do specifically on a site-by-site -site basis that can all be um, shared and continuously integrated ahead of time. Right, and the, the data at the site layer is, is all sort of boilerplate and IP addresses, basically. There's nothing particular at a site. <laughs> um, yeah. So the question was, this looks awfully complicated for a small set of deployments. Um, again, we are starting coming from the standpoint of we want thousands or ten thousands of deployments. Right? So we believe it can reasonably scale down to, say, three sites, um, and I, I think we're not so far from that, but I think that what we really need is better discovery tooling to help you write these site definitions. We have Treasure Map, which we'll, we'll reference a few times as a, a working example of a complete site configuration for, it's like an eight node site or something, if I recall. Um, however, there's definitely I, what I would consider the authoring of the configuration, like before it goes into the site, there's definitely lots of room for improvement there. Um, and yeah. yeah. And, and uh, 
know, we, we released or we, we announced our release candidate uh, for Airship, right? Um, and that we are working toward a 1.0 release. And so what's the difference between a release candidate and a 1.0 release? Is a release candidate not production ready? Well, no, that's not the message because uh, we're, many organizations are already using this release candidate in production and it is um, very reliable. Um, the biggest thing that we want to achieve for our 1.0 release is to, is to make that easier uh, so you don't have to learn um, too much YAML black magic to get started. Um, because I, and if, if anyone in the audience hate, hates YAMLs, I apologize, you should close your eyes. Because- uh, You can just write JSON, it's fine. And, and, and let me put it this way. There is a lot of complexity involved in standing up any OpenStack site. And even more if you're talking about provisioning an entire site and defining all the things that go into a real world um, infrastructure. Um, and so part of the design decision of Airship is it simplifies um, a lot of that and it puts all the complexity in one place. So really, if the YAMLs are co complex, well, a little bit, but at least that's the only thing that you have to care about, the only thing you have to care for. All right. Right, so Matt actually alluded to some of these already. Um, so <clears throat> Matt went over basically the, the core deduplication features and um, that was what we rolled out with and we discovered it wasn't really enough. Um, so in particular, uh, we, um, because we reference documents for, in two different ways, sort of, um, either by label or by name, essentially, um, it turned out that sometimes, well, I really want a document with this name, but I want it slightly changed from globals. Um, and maybe this is a, a result of not having ideal factoring of documents up front, but it turned out to be useful. Or, or you can imagine like, wow, this one particular site has this problem. It's a hardware problem and I can work around it with a very particular config override in something that's in global or something. So replacement lets you replace a document from a higher layer, basically. Um, and with, with minor tweaks. And so that's particularly useful for triage and so forth. Um, we use it a lot less now than we did. We've, we've really restructured our, our documents, but it's still a useful feature. Um, multiple destination, destination substitution. Um, sometimes we were substituting a control plane IP into like five or six places in one document. Um, so this simplifies that, <laughs> reduces the amount of boilerplate. You could always do it, but now you can just list three or four destinations in one block of metadata. Um, and then even that was too repetitive. So back to the versions definition that um, Matt was referring to. We have, um, we host all of our images and, and charts really in Artifactory, um, but it's not always the same Artifactory per site, basically. And so what we'd really like to do is go through this entire document and replace every occurrence of a particular string with our particular Artifactory host name. That's what recursive substitution lets you do. Uh, if the name is not clear, that's the intent. Um, so that's the primary use case for that, just to make that fairly simple to do. All right, validation. So this uh, is back to the choice to make this a, a sort of a push model, not a templating model. Yes, question. Good question. Great question. So the question was, uh, when does layering and substitution happen? The answer is at rendering time, which is on demand. So when something queries the deckhand API, it performs a rendering operation and delivers the rendered output of, uh, of those YAMLs. Um, yeah. And question. deckhand has uh, just a regular get API. It's a RESTful API. You, you basically say, hey, deckhand, give me, give me this document. Uh, it checks to make sure you are who you say you are, and then it dynamically, like Mark says, pulls together all of the uh, all of the the parenting, does a substitution, does a lot of work to get you one document. Right, and so substitution would include things like passphrases, right? So you store the passphrase document as encrypted, um, but say Armada fetches just all the charts that it's going to deploy. It has the passphrase in line there. It doesn't have to know that it's special. It can just do its regular work. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I think you're, it, basically I would, I would phrase that as uh, do we cache the results of rendering? Yes, in memory, not in database, because again, some of those things are sensitive. Yeah. Okay, uh, so anyway, that was schema validation. You write JSON schemas. Sorry. Um, it's very simple. It's just that you can ask Deccan to do that. You submit the schemas like regular documents. 
again, they're control documents, which means you can't do substitution and layering, basically. Traceability. Maybe we, we were a little low on time, so I'm going to go very briefly here. Um, <laughs> so I mentioned before that declarative is great. We can store everything in Git. We have some authoring tooling or some sort of front-end tooling in Pegleg that is before you get to the site, um, and it gathers up all this configuration from various Git repos. Um, it doesn't do this yet. That's why I drew a dashed line, but you can easily imagine it querying something for certificate data or other sensitive data, uh, some sort of vault API or whatever. Um, so there's room for that kind of growth. Um, and then it feeds those into Shipyard, where they go into Deckhand finally to be stored and locked down in Barbicon for if there's secret data. And then queried by all the components in the site. So that's sort of the flow, and Deckhand tracks what was delivered. Um, and Shipyard will actually annotate the releases, the revisions, so that you know what was deployed and so forth. Um, so that you have that traceability on site. So this is my favorite. Uh... Uh, my favorite deckhand feature, uh, encryption. And it is my favorite because it's that simple. Um, there, you have a, a storage policy uh, in your uh, deckhand metadata um, that just says on a document by document basis whether it is encrypted or in clear text. Um, behind the scenes, deckhand uses uh, Barbican uh, for uh, persistence of encrypted data. Um, and so, like Mark said, you'd use this for things like, um, like certificates and uh, or keys and passphrases, anything that's, uh, anything that's uh, a secret that you would not want to persist to disk in clear text. And we're very lucky that we did it this way. So it doesn't matter whether you have structured data or not here, um, because um, it actually just uses a consistent serialization and then encrypts it. Um, and so we have been asked by our security department to decrypt, to encrypt other kinds of documents that we wouldn't have expected to be sensitive or wouldn't normally be considered sensitive in some cases. Um, and so those are structured documents. So Hey, look, we got that one for free, finally. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the, um, let's see, the, uh, sorry, this is not the latest. Idea. This is not the latest. <laughs> I apologize. It's my bad. Uh, we uh, integrate with several other OpenStack projects uh, to realize many of these things. Uh, we wanted to reinvent the wheel as little as possible. Um, I mentioned that we use uh, Barbican. Uh, for secrets management. Uh, we also leverage Keystone uh, for uh, our identity service, and all of Airship uses uh, Keystone uh, for identity. Um, Keystone is one of the, uh, the charts that gets deployed in uh, an Airship under cloud. Uh, we also use Oslo for policy definitions, so if you're familiar with uh, defining a policy for um, OpenStack components, defining policy for Airship is going to be very familiar. Uh, and then we use OpenStack Helm extensively. OpenStack Helm is the Helm chart library for OpenStack, uh, which is what makes it easy for us to deploy Keystone and Barbican um, and, and other components as well. And we are, um, you know, Mark had mentioned that uh, we leverage uh, Maz for um, our, as the plugin for Drydock to drive our bare metal provisioning, we want to add other components uh, like Ironic. Um, and the fact that there is already an Ironic Helm chart out there um, gives us a great head start on that effort. So, use cases. Um, the, you know, we, we've been talking about airship in, uh, about deckhand in an airship context, which is the driver for creating it, but we made it very, um, very reusable. It is a very general purpose um, YAML rendering and storage mechanism. Um, and so if you have heard any features today that um, sound like something that your own application could make use of um, from a, a data store perspective, well, that was part of why we wanted to give this talk. Uh, we are very interested in your use cases. Uh, please reach out to us and um, you know, join, join the Deckhand team or, or join our, our uh, Airship IRC chats to let us know uh, of your interest um, because we want to make this a, a very reusable component in the OpenStack community. Great. So um, as Matt was saying, we're looking for more use cases here. Uh, one of the fundamental things that we care about in the Airship team is making all the components as reasonably independent as possible. So yes, when you do a full Airship deployment, every component queries deckhand. But guess what? No component requires deckhand. So that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, but generally speaking, Deckhand is sort of a core component. You're likely to use it if you're using much other uh, stuff from Airship. Um, but even so, that doesn't mean you have to use all the other components. And so we're looking for more use cases for Deckhand specifically. Um, the implementation is a little challenging in some places. Um, I think there's a lot of room for uh, streamlining that. Um, so I'm hopeful there. 
Um, and the other thing is that it's actually like a little bit difficult. We have a couple of projects who have had need of using a deckhand sort of client-side engine. Pegleg is the main example where we want to do validation upfront, offline, before it goes into the site. Um, but that's actually a little bit awkward today, and that's more of a project structuring issue that we need to work on. But I think that's, those are the sort of the main things going forward with Deccan. So we have a few upcoming um, talks for the Airship project in general. Uh, uh, actually, all tomorrow, I guess. So uh, please take a look and join us. We'll be happy to have you and answer questions. Um, you can reach out to us on uh, the Airship It IRC channel and check things out on airshipit.org. Thank you. Yeah, hope to see you guys tomorrow. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, question. 30 seconds. Okay, so the question is, have you considered, rather than using a source document for substitution, that you could make an API call? So that, that makes sense. However, I would say the way we would be likely to handle that would be to have some sort of uh, farther left tooling like Pegleg query an API to find out that data and then send it into the site as a document. So have, have some tooling construct a standard YAML document that gets used as a substitution source. Does that make sense? The reason for that is that we want it all to live on site. And so if you're depending on some sort of, uh, you know, corporate API that knows the IP addresses of your servers, for example, you don't want to have to do that on site at the moment when you're reprovisioning a down host. Right? That would be awkward. So, so that's all front loaded. And what if it changes? What if you deploy the site with a particular revision of your software and that data changes? How do you track that? Those are the kinds of things that we worry about and why there's no dynamic configuration pulled there, if that makes sense. Okay, I, I'm going to try to repeat this as best I can. So the, the context of the question was, um, let's say, so Pegleg, you know, imports the deckhand engine to use primarily for validation. Um, and the question was, as I understand it, if it existed in deckhand as a feature, then Pegleg could use it as a feature, right? Okay. Um, true, but... but it doesn't necessarily make sense inside Deckhand in any context because Pegleg's not going to deliver rendered documents to the site. It's going to deliver the complete bundle of raw documents to the site, and that's Deckhand's job to render them on demand. Because some of them need to be stored and encrypted, and that's Deckhand's job to make sure that ha happens through Barbicon. And Pegleg would, if it rendered everything, it would be spreading secrets all over all of it, and you'd have to encrypt the entire payload. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, and, and also, if, if this sounds like a, a whole lot of different little components of Airship, uh, please go to the Treasure Map project, Airship-Treasure Map, uh, which uh, in the OpenStack uh, Git namespace, which uh, has some diagrams to sort of show the different responsibilities of these Airship components and how they, how they work together. I think we have hey, one uh, more minute for I have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, is it possible with Deccan to divide your configs and secrets into different environments like uh, dev, prod, and staging? Yes. You would only typically deliver the configuration for your particular site to the site. So Pegleg's job actually is you have this repository. It chooses, it selects the configuration from your Git repositories that belong to that site and ships them along. So it's really Pegleg's job to make sure that the correct set of configuration is delivered to the site, and it's Deckhand's job to organize that and store it properly. Does that make sense? Mm. So um, how would you um, reuse uh, secrets or, let's say, configs that are reused across environments? Right. So I would consider your different environments like dev, prod, staging, whatever, to be just different sites. They're probably all the same type with some slight overrides based on the differences. So you spell it out. This is, this is at least how we're doing it in our environments. And um, so they're all sharing the same global and type configs. Their site configs are different, but as you have, have seen, that's smaller, and it's like 95% IP addresses, basically, right? And so 
that's, that's how you would do it. You'd grab the same global and type. Peg leg's job would be to grab this global, this type, or well, global is global, I guess, right? But, uh, <clears throat> and then the particular details for the site and ship that off. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Cool. And, and if, uh, if you have other kinds of use cases that you want to talk through, um, we'd be happy to, to talk through those um, offline because, uh, you know, we've, we've solved several different flavors of that same challenge, um, and there, there are different approaches that you can, you can take. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you.